Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session on universal access to energy. My name is Claire Laurie, and I'm from a company called FTI Consulting in South Africa. The topic of universal access energy is very important because we're all aware of the benefits that that brings to living standards and also economic growth to the continent. However, we have a curious situation in Africa. On one hand, we have one of the lowest rates of energy access in the world. Some say it is at 38%. That effectively means about 600 million people on the continent do lack access to electricity. And it varies between countries, and of course it also varies between rural areas and urban areas. Yep. So that's on the one hand. Yep. On the other, we also have in Africa relatively abundant resources. We have coal, we have oil, we have natural gas, and we certainly have sun, and we certainly have wind. Yeah. So it seems that how do these two come, how do you connect these two things together? Yeah. Also bearing in mind, the world is going through an energy transition. So it'd be good to also discuss what's the transition happening in Africa yep. into a lower carbon economy and an increasingly electrified world. So to discuss with you here today, we have four gentlemen on the panel, some from government, some from energy and infrastructure investors. So I would just like you to briefly introduce yourself of who you are and what do you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Caspar uh, Herzberg. I uh, manage Middle East and Africa for Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric is a supplier of solutions in energy management and process automation. So we're very close to the energy topic. My name is Fortune Chassi. I'm the Minister for Energy and Power Development in Zimbabwe. Uh, my name is Sam Alamayo. I'm the Global Managing Director for Cambridge Industries. We're energy developers throughout Africa and um, we're focused on renewable energy projects and we've just built the first waste to energy project in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where we process 80% of the garbage in a city of 5 million people and produce 25% of the household electricity in the city. Um, my name is Yas Doida. I'm from Mitsubishi Corporation. Um, we are having activity worldwide, and I'm the regional CEO for Africa. Um, especially in Africa, uh, energy sector is one of the very interesting and important um, uh, investment area that we are thinking especially looking at the current status of Africa, as you just mentioned. Uh, I think uh, the, the continent should be electrified, and uh, we would be we're willing to contribute to achieve that. Very good. Thank you very much. Let's start with Zimbabwe. Let's start with you, Fortune. Yes. So there's certainly energy issues in Zimbabwe. Yes. What's the plan? What's the plan for increasing energy access and reliability in Zimbabwe? Well, let me start by setting out the background to our current uh, uh, power challenges. Uh, we, we are victims of uh, climate change insofar as the uh, Kariba Dam, which was our baseline, is uh, concerned. Uh, the, the dam has been going downwards uh, inexorably, particularly over the past few months, to the extent that now live water is at uh, um, just above 20%. Um, We've, we also have significant challenges on our uh, equipment, thermal side of things, uh, antiquated uh, thermals. Um, and so that has impacted heavily on our economy, but we also have uh, huge numbers of people, particularly in the rural areas, who have got no connection whatsoever with uh, energy sources. So in terms of um, us um, propelling ourselves forward, we are currently working on an integrated resource plan. Um, the major challenge is that we have relied for a long time on the hydro side of things. And so the risk attendant on Lake Kariba is affecting us negatively. So now we're working on renewables, uh, solar especially, uh, wind, gas, and uh, uh, we're doing all we can to ensure that uh, we deplete the power deficit that we, we have and, in fact, power poverty in the rural areas. And uh, we're aiming um, 
around 2030 to have a minimum of uh, 11,500 megawatts. Um, our figures at the moment are very unreliable and very low. So in the energy mix, you have fossil fuels and also renewables. Are you deliberately increasing the renewables proportion? Yes, definitely. Okay. We, as I indicated, we are a victim of climate change. So um, we are moving in the area of renewables deliberately, first of all, to, to get sufficient power. But we think that we also have a role to play uh, as a nation to ensure that we go green and uh, play as little as possible a role um, around issues of climate, um, the worsening climate uh, change situation. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Yasuhiro, do you, what, what path do you think Africa will take? Do you think it's going to rebalance between fossil fuels, increase access, increase growth, but also reduce CO2 emissions? Sure, the carbon footprint issue is serious and um, uh, you have to, but you have to actually look into what sort of energy mix is, is appropriate in this continent. For example, the case of, of our country in Japan, we used to have a lot of nuclear. And I think nuclear accounted about 40% of the energies uh, up till uh, we had a tragedy in 2011, followed by a tsunami and an accident. And then we suddenly lost 40% of our power as a base load. But in Japan, we don't have, um, we have a very limited local production of coal or fossil fuels. So all we had to do to actually import uh, natural gas and the cost went up very sharply. In case of Africa, you have fossil fuels and certain portion must be uh, used for the base load to, to, to supply power to this continent. But having said that, this continent, 50% of people doesn't have access to energy. Okay. And in order to resolve that, I, I don't think fossil fuel uh, production of fossil fuel energy is going to uh, re resolve that. And also, um, because you only have 50% energy access, you have the option to go to, for example, off-grid um, power. And I think the, the, the role of off-grid power is, uh, to play in Africa is going to be huge. And uh, we as a company, we invested, recently invested to, to uh, uh, off-grid uh, power uh, supply company called Bbox. And they're operating in nine countries in Africa, expanding to 12. And that business model can be extended even to Asia. But I think mixture of off-grid and on-grid is going to be uh, very, very important in order to, to, to satisfy the, the power needs in this continent. So Africa will have to have its own power source, different from other area. And I think the mixture between the off-grid and on-grid, utilizing this, uh, the solar power and the renewable energy is going to be essential in this continent. Okay, and one of the other major trends is that Africa is rapidly urbanizing. Um, does the rapid urbanization, does that bring opportunity for increased energy access, Casper? Well, I mean, on, on, on paper, yes. Uh, so it's clearly easier to supply energy to people living in a city uh, than it is to do that in a remote rural uh, area if you use the grid. At the same time, I'm not sure that urbanization is an entirely positive uh, phenomenon, right? And I'm not sure that we, um, looking at the, the energy usage of cities, of buildings, can continue and that our planet can afford it, right? So, and I think if you travel around Africa um, and you look at all the high power lines and then you see the townships below it, then you will know that going that last uh, 50 meters, that last mile, that, you know, that last distance to the end user, is very difficult. Uh, I mean, and there are lots, lots of social issues around, uh, around it, right? Uh, everywhere. Uh, so, if you ask me, I mean, given that we have globally a trend to go towards uh, decentralized grids, that we have all the opportunities of mini grids, that we, uh, that we have all that, I think an integrated approach, right? Of course, you want to make cities more livable. You want them also make them significantly more efficient in the energy that they use. And you want to, you, you want to focus on the rural areas with mini grids to reverse the trend of rural urban migration. Because I mean, one thing we found in, I think it was in Nigeria, but also elsewhere, that uh, when you put a functioning mini grid 
with a business model in a previously disconnected community, it reverses the trend and creates a new local hub. Mm. So people go there instead of going to the city, which I think ultimately is a, is a good thing. Right. Okay, and Samuel, um, what do you think are the right business models of increasing energy access in mm -hmm. rural areas? I think with everything that we've talked about so far, the key thing is each country, each region has kind of a specific type of energy mix, specific set of challenges. So in the urban areas, you need, because you have a concentrated consumption of power, you could provide large scale transmission lines, have the distribution system, and could focus on the large developments. In urban and rural areas, it's usually simplified, signified by the fact that they are distributed. It's mostly agricultural. And, and the fact is, in Africa, that is your largest employment base. So if you're going to have any significant amount of development in a country, uh, which you want kind of the investment in electricity to be an engine, a catalyst towards economic development, you need to be having productive power. So right now you have a huge amount of money that is spent on small solar panels that are used for a little bit of a light bulb or, or, or plugging up, charging your phone. That's great. But if you want the economic engine to change, you need productive power. You need to be able to have the type of power that allows you to pump water. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily need to come from a transmission line. It could just be a solar panel with that specific product. Uh, you need the ability to weld. Uh, so it's a combination of solar biomass, because if it's purely solar, then it does not have um, the base load requirement so that you're working 24-7, you're working on demand, you're relying on the sporadic appearance of the sun or, or, or the wind. So you need to complement uh, biomass, and biomass is great in agricultural areas because it puts back money because the fuel is agricultural waste. Um, there's a significant amount of complementary power in those areas. Then the other engine for growth, especially as the rural community, as the agricultural sector is starting to improve, is manufacturing. Because the biggest problem that Africa has and we have to solve is employing our amazing youth. We, have, we will have 50% of the world labor force very soon. And if that's going to be the case, it needs to be employed labor force. It needs to be productive labor force. And, and for those, for kind of you know, the policy that you have for rural electrification is the mini grids. It's making sure that specific uh, products and, and engines have their own power source. And for manufacturing sector that usually relies on the agricultural output, then you need to have them concentrated in industrial parks so that you can service them easily. It makes it easy for private investors like us to be able to come in, bid on what we're good at, which is just generating the power. If we have to also do the transmission, the distribution, it makes it very hard and prohibitive. We have big power utilities, off-grid, on-grid, energy management systems. This is sounding super expensive. Are private investors, um, is this attractive to build up the, the infrastructure required to do this? You, know, you mentioned that you made the, a major investment. Is it attractive to investors? Yes, um, the situation has changed dra dramatically in the last probably five years. The cost of the, 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 the solar panel, the cost of the batteries, I think has reduced to a level that we couldn't even think of five years ago. For example, I just mentioned about uh, the, the tragedy in 2011. Um, the government at that time probably didn't think that solar or renewable energy can replace vast amount of, uh, of the power that we lost. But today, if you look at the situation, because of the cost went down, um, the, the business itself is going to, uh, is going to be viable, it's gonna, it's gonna work. Is it cheaper than fossil fuels? Well, it, it oh. could become cheaper in the, okay. in the near future. So that's the projection. And with that kind of following, I think Africa needs power from off-grid. But okay. on-grid is also important, and also government initiative is also very important. So we need, the government should support uh, without having the government support, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to electrify um, Africa. So each government will have to have a clear plan to, to supply energy to all people, including the regulations, or uh, even paying subsidies to, to, to those areas. But I think uh, from business point of view, the, the, the cooperation between the government and the private sector is going to help a great deal in the future. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll add on to that. I mean, the simple answer is yes. 
it absolutely makes business sense. Right now, look at Nigeria. The amount of diesel generators that are being used, that's 30, 40 cents a kilowatt hour. You don't even have to compete on that level. Like, there is a huge amount of money that is being spent. There is a significant amount of growth that is kept back, bottlenecked because of power. If you have the right type of investment environment, there isn't an attractive place better than in Africa, because in other places, you're fighting against legacy existing infrastructures that have been built, money that have already been spent. They are all you need. There's a huge amount of money going around trying to find opportunities to develop. Yeah. If governments could make it easier, so countries that have made it attractive for power developers to come in and invest, there's a huge amount of interest. And solar has gotten so expensive. Some of the bids that you see out of Egypt uh, and South Africa, extremely competitive, beating out fossil fuel as well. Casper, yeah. do you share this view that it's an attractive investment for the private sector? Uh, yes. I mean, it's an opportunity. You said 600, six, 600 700 million, million people, yeah, yeah. right, without access. So across Africa, so of course that in sheer numbers is a very attractive business proposition. At the same time, I mean, if it was easy to do, it would have been done by now. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, and the fact that it is still at times difficult to do, even when now the price of the el energy that you generate is at times half that of, of, uh, of, of kerosene, especially in Nigeria. So the, the further you go away from the coast, the more you go inland, the more expensive kerosene is. So it's actually easy to compete. But the challenge that, uh, that we have seen is the business model around the mini grid. So that is, what do people do with the energy? How do they integrate into the local economy? Um, how can that be done sustainably? And more importantly even, how do, the, how do you maintain and operate these mini-grids? Because very often, the skills to do that are not there, are not where you need them. They, they might be somewhere else. And actually, I mean, two days ago, I was in a neighboring country, and I met with someone who was a decision maker, and he told me, you know, my country is full of uh, abandoned mini grids, half stolen, destroyed, because we don't have the, these were all given by donors, and we don't have the skills to maintain them. So I think to make this work, uh, different skills, more relevant skills at the basic, I mean, I come from the electricity energy uh, industry, so this is basic electrical skills are needed uh, at scale, right? And that is, to your point, a public-private partnership to make all of that really relevant, that these people are employable, not just in the formal, but also in the informal economy. So it's technical skills and basic business skills to operate these small grids. That, that's kind of what I do okay. see. I'd be interested to, to how you see that. Uh, I mean, uh, I sure. I mean, refer back to you. But. I mean, the, the, the way we we're looking at it, mm. it is a very attractive investment because if you are generating electricity, mm. the demand is there. The problem is a lot of, I mean, it falls back to, again, I'm, I'm gonna push it back to governments because when you're coming as an investor, yeah. the one thing that you wanna see is predictability. Yeah. If I am making investment, which a lot of it is CapEx up front, you wanna be able to see what's gonna happen 15 years from now, 20 years yeah. from now. Usually you want the government to guarantee that it's gonna be purchased yeah. whatever you produce. Not every government has created the environment to be able to do that. Yeah. And, and kind of a lot of the mini grids that are now working, I mean, the donor dynamics and stuff, that is different. If it is private-led, and, and you could see in mm. Somaliland, where it's autonomous, mm. not accepted, but you have power sectors that work flawlessly. But they're charging a dollar a kilowatt hour. Um, it's extremely expensive, but it works. So the supply is there, the demand is there, the growth is there, but is it affordable? You could make it affordable if the government steps in and allows you to have predictability. You, you, a number of you mentioned the government steps in. What do you mean by that? What is it you want the government to do? So, I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump it from, from my we, side. We, we discussed this last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you, so I'll, I'll, I'll say two basic things. One, in urban areas, really creating distribution lines, allowing the right type of investment for distribution lines to be created. So this is on a household level, either give a mandate to a company that have the right to build that distribution line so that, and, and also make sure that people end up paying for it. 
and, and charge. Uh, continuously, a lot of cities, you see lots of challenges, but if that system is there, there is a specific fit in tariff, then investors will jump in. They know what they're gonna get, they will make it attractive, make it, make it competitive. It could be a bid, but at the end of the day, a specific set of kind of, this is what we're willing to purchase, and this is our ability to be able to distribute it and sell it. If governments are able to do that, then it becomes an attractive place. I can give you one example. Um, I went to a country called Togo. Togo is a very small country in, in the Western Africa, but they are committed to light up the country. And the government has officially announced its plan. Uh, I think their energy um, supply ratio of today is about 40%, 40, 45%. They clearly mentioned that within one year, it's going to be 50%, and until 2020, it's gonna to go to 75%, and we will light up the whole country by 2030. For example, the government has shown uh, uh, its clear target, and also government is promoting to, to those off-grid, and also uh, they're also providing uh, from hydro as well. So they have a clear plan what to do until 2030, how to electrify the whole country. And they're also providing subsidies to those people coming, and um, tax incentive, etc. So if the government is committed to do something with a clear vision and how to achieve that, uh, I think it's going to be very easy for the investor to go to that country and to, to, to uh, create um, those kind of um, um, energy sources in the future. So what I said is that the government must be um, determined to do. And with that determination, the public company can have um, the cooperation and actually achieve the, uh, the objective. So government initiative is vital. Okay. Anything to add on? <laughs> We're going to come to you next after we get... Oh, um, anything to add, no, Casper? I no, I think you should go first. So we've had subsidies, uh, distribution systems, clear vision and strategy, yes. um, tax incentives. Is that something government is prepared to do? Uh, I, I think so. Um, and, and I think the colleagues are right in saying that uh, governments have to be sensitive to the needs of investors. And in our unique situation in Zimbabwe, where we have uh, significant um, challenges in the area of uh, power generation, its distribution, even on the consumption side, um, we, 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 we are working right now on a panoply of uh, incentives that are extraordinary because our situation is not ordinary. So we cannot give incentives that are found everywhere else where the circumstances are, are different. So we, we have, uh, we're in a unique situation where, uh, for example, we're not able to uh, take advantage of uh, any facilities that exist um, within uh, international development institutions by virtue of the fact that we are sanctioned. So it's very difficult for us to get credit lines, um, to get any form of financing for projects. So we tend to uh, need investors who are able to come with their own financing. And the issue then is how are they able to take, uh, to pay back uh, the loans that they've taken or to pay, to, to pay the, you know, their, their shareholders their, their dividends. And so we have had to be very, very innovative in terms of how do we structure a deal that allows an investor to get the satisfaction that uh, they'll be able to take out their investment, either termination or when they want to make some, some payments. So you will find that in some instances we have discussed with an investor and we have ring-fenced um, uh, off-takers who, mm -hmm. for example, could be in the mining sector and they earn foreign currency. Mm -hmm. And so we, we then come up with a structure that enables uh, those off-takers to pay the investor directly. So we're, we're keeping on thinking of how can we make the investor happy. Uh, Feed-in tariffs, we are working on those. We want internationally accepted uh, PPAs, which are readily available. And we're working on ensuring that our investors can apply for licenses remotely without having to come to Zimbabwe. And we do the legwork ourselves by approaching all the relevant government departments, uh, for example, in acquisition of land, um, talking to the utility. So we play that facilitator role within the ministry, my ministry, as well as the one-stop um, uh, investment center that we have uh, set up. 
And so it's very important that we are very conscious of the needs of the investor. What is it that we need to do as Zimbabwe to attract those people that want to come invest in our power sector? And this is the area of growth. We are looking at technology companies because we believe that technology has a big role to play uh, in the generation supply and management uh, of, of power. Uh, we are looking at managing the demand side where we have not been doing so well, retrofitting. And so all those ideas require that we come up with appropriate uh, incentives, which are all contained in an, an energy investment policy that is publicly known and investors can access it without much of a hassle. And is governments getting much support in terms of de development funding and development finance, whether it be from, I hear from the Paris Agreement, there was a hundred billion dollar fund created, EU funding, is there much, or DBSE, IDC, yeah. is there finance coming from there that will help the government? Um, they, they are basically confined to technical assistance. Right. And in terms of actual investment, if that were to be available, it would make a huge difference to, difference to our economy at the moment. And so, in a sense, we are manacled. Uh, we are not able to access what other countries um, are able to access at the moment. So, we see a growing role for the private sector. Mm -hmm. okay. And we see a transformation of a our utility, energy, utility, power utility, and we think that that is inevitable. Mm -hmm. So our focus is creating a congenial and, and convenient environment for the private sector to operate, and also for private individuals. And this is the trend across the world, where individuals also become generators of, of power and they can make you know, a business out of it. Colleagues are talking about uh, agriculture, for example. Uh, some of you will be aware that we have had a, um, a, a land reform program where you now have numerous but small farmers. And so the off-grid model is going to be very useful for us um, around farming communities to you know, erect a, a plant for them that will give them sufficient power. Right now, it's a huge problem which um, will affect food security um, in Zimbabwe. So the model that we're looking at is really initially coming up with the, uh, 5, 10, 15 megawatts, mm -hmm. which we feed into the system. And then it can be escalated as we go along, as opposed to a huge project, um, say 600 megawatts, that yep. will take two years to implement. So when we have all these scattered around the country, um, we believe that we'll achieve our objective of having 11,000 uh, and above megawatts uh, by 2030. And we're looking at being a net exporter of power to the region. There are many countries who are challenged on the power side. And so we also want to look at it as a business opportunity for Zimbabwe. So the discomfort that we're feeling right now um, we are translating that into a huge opportunity for investment. The issue of skills is very important for us because most of our engineers were trained on hydro. And so most people, when they hear about renewables, it's sort of a, com a competitive uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So we're now looking at young people who have been trained in renewables, and we prefer partners that come and leave skills, help to train our people, and uh, our high literacy rate helps us in, in that regard. And also the advent of uh, new technologies uh, in, this, in the power area, as well as um, we're, we're currently um, developing a policy around electric motor vehicles and uh, making sure that we solarize everything that can be solarized. Government departments, uh, service stations, uh, will be required to have charging ports. Any new structures that are being built, we are making it a requirement that um, renewable energies must be part and parcel of that process. Yeah. So some governments are setting electricity tariffs and, and some are setting them at a price which is lower than it costs to produce the electricity. 
because they want to, on one hand, of course, they've got to keep affordability uh, for the population, mm -hmm. but the price is on the economic. Is, is something like setting tariffs? And do you see a role for the private sector there? Do you see a role for the government there? Yes. We, for example, we have just come up with a new tariff. It's still not uh, cost-reflective, but it's an improvement on, on what we, we have had. And given the macroeconomic challenges that we have, where salaries are not moving at the same pace, where the, there is volatility on the um, exchange rate and, and so forth, we, the, the tariff is a work in progress. And um, it's a moving target uh, that we're pushing towards cost reflectivity because we realize that this is an important incentive. In fact, probably the first incentive that the, the investor has got to take into account before they come to Zimbabwe to say that will the off-taker be able to pay me at this rate. So there is a very clear recognition of that fact, but also to protect the vulnerable in our economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the recent tariff that we have got has got a lifeline um, for, for the lower end of the, of the market. And uh, some form of uh, maybe, I don't want to call it a penalty, but an increased rate when they move from the, the basic units that they have been given. But it's a matter that we are interrogating as we go along. We're actually making more efforts right now to see how, to what extent can we improve it more in tandem with what is happening uh, on, at the macro level. Thank you. So Thank you. I'm looking to the audience now. Does anyone here have any questions? Um, go ahead. Do we have a microphone somewhere? Thank you. Alma Price, Alliance News, uh, question for the minister. Um, I was in Zimbabwe in February last year and I visited your a small hydro on the Eastern Highlands and the solar park uh, just north of Harare. Yeah. Uh, they were done by NRE. If you can just uh, tell the audience what's happened since February last year because circumstances have changed. In addition to that, uh, does Zimbabwe have something like in Co Copa, uh, small off-grid solar power, and I haven't heard anything. Um, is that on the books? Are you looking at that? And then lastly, if you can just uh, give me an update on what's happening with Batoka. Yes. Um, maybe to, to start with uh, Batoka, we think we are on, on, on target. Um, the Council of Ministers met uh, um, two months ago, and we gave the green light for the project to commence uh, in earnest. We expect that there will be groundbreaking um, before year end. And we are satisfied that we've done all that is necessary for the, for the project to, to proceed. When, when will this power be available from the um, Three to four years. It's a big project. Now, coming to the solar grid in the Eastern Highlands, it's really a model that uh, um, um, has been very useful. And uh, in that, it demonstrates that power is not power for its own sake. And the local people, uh, apart from the businesses, are beginning to engage in economic activity that was not conceivable before this system um, was put in place. And of course, uh, this is one project where, which has brought uh, into sharp relief the need for us to look at, at the tariff and also to be in a, innovative in terms of coming up with a, uh, a structure to enable the investors to take out their money. We, we are in constant uh, discussions with them. In fact, I met them last week, and we were looking at increasing and improving the, the structure that is there so that there is an assurance that they will, they will get uh, their resources. I, I think I, I forgot the second question. It's, a, it's based similar to the M-Pesa platform in Kenya. Yes. Um, and what MCORPA does is they give you something that's sort of oh, 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 double okay. the size yes. um, and that powers electricity and, uh, for lights and for yes. solar charging. Yes. But it's, it's distributed uh, you, power. You, you see, over the past few months, the, there's been a, a phenomenal um, rise 
in the um, products that relate to solar that are coming into the country. And we're very delighted by this. Um, our, one of the issues that we're looking at now is standardization of the equipment um, so that we are getting genuine equipment that can be, so that pu public is not uh, taken, uh, taken advantage of. But there are so many versions of this um, which are on a, a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, for some of them, maybe $2 a month. And so it's, it's really affordable by the, by the common uh, person. Uh, most of them cannot really power a project. Uh, and so the, the small grids that I'm talking about have a role to play. But in the interim, uh, when a rural family has got access to light, it means that children can study yes. at night, yes. which at the moment is not possible. And so um, because of that, the lives of young, of children are being ruined. But we, we also see, for example, if you look at the area of technology, we, we have a huge um, effort that we have made over the years mm -hmm. to make sure that all school children have got access to computers. But this is not possible without uh, power. And so um, these are areas that we want to focus to make sure that all the schools have electricity. And our rural electrification agency is doing a lot of work in this respect, um, which will change lives of our children in the rural areas. Any more questions from the audience? If you want to take the microphone over here. My name is Lois Outer. And this year's team is talking about inclusive growth. I want to ask, in your various organizations, do you have persons with disabilities as your staff? Business with? Do persons you, with disabilities. In your organization, in your organization do you working? have people with disabilities in your organization? Yes. Yeah. Yes? Many. But, but yeah. I, I think it's, it's yeah. a very important question That's because true. I think in a systemic base, you may have that for large scale companies, but as new companies are being created, um, it, it needs to, more work needs to be done to be more inclusive, more understanding, have laws, have systems to create a workplace um, that, that makes uh, people of disability thrive and succeed. And I think the continent as a whole needs to do a much, much better job on that. Um, I, I, and I think all of us, especially startup companies, need to be more inclusive of that. Yeah. Um, um, in, in terms of uh, how we look at the situation in Zimbabwe, we, we recognize a very special role for people living with disabilities because most of the time they are overlooked, uh, whether it's in transportation and so forth. But in addition to that, we are also saying what is uh, the place of young people in our energy policies and also what is the role of uh, women um, in the energy sector, because we know that particularly in the rural areas, women are the ones who have got to make sure there's firewood. In the urban areas in Zimbabwe now, if you move at night in the high desert areas, you'll find that um, um, men are, you know, either in the bars or sitting outside as a group, enjoying themselves, and the women have to make sure that uh, there is power in the house of whatever form to make sure that they cook for the family. So uh, the way we are going is also to develop policies that are inclusive of women as players and stakeholders uh, in the energy sector to understand precisely how they can fit into what we are having to do at the moment. Uh, some in Zimbabwe um, are having to look for use plastic bottles for, for cooking. And so there is a conflict there. We're trying to deal with climate change issues yes. on the one hand, mm -hmm. but uh, because of unavailability of power, people are forced to use materials that actually fuel uh, the problem that we're trying to deal with. So I think it's a legitimate uh, question, and in our circumstances, we're tackling it. Thank you. There was another question over here. Hi. 
Hello, Erin Baker from Time Magazine. Um, we've been talking mostly about renewables, but uh, we also understand in Africa, some of the best resources for economic development are, of course, fossil fuels. So how do we incentivize governments of these nations to focus more on renewable energy instead of using or exploiting these fossil fuels for economic development? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's actually doing what the Honorable Minister was, was, was saying earlier, which I understood to be um, a national dialogue, a national matrix mm. for, what, uh, for how you want to generate your energy, how much of that, in a very transparent way, mm. how much of that you want to come from fossil fuels, how much you want to have from renewables, what the price points would be of, of uh, of all of these, and then have a five, ten year plan about how you want to change that over time. That gives us the predictability that you mentioned, right? That once you, makes you want to invest in a certain form um, of energy generation or distribution thereof, that allows you as a prosumer to feed that back, what you generate uh, back into the overall grid. I think it's this kind of national energy plan that not just in Zimbabwe, but in any country in Africa, I think would be a, is a very good thing to, to engage in. I mean, I, I would like to add on just yeah. on top of that, a lot of renewable energy projects could be very, very competitive to uh, fossil fuel power, especially yeah. a few geothermal sites. There are some wind sites like, like Turkana, which is very competitive, but it is location-based. It's not everywhere. And yeah. the way to tap into that is what's happening with the East African Power Pool, the South African Power Pool, where, as the minister was talking, you generate even beyond the capacity of what your country is able to consume, it allows you to export. Uh, it, it puts no limits whatsoever. So the Inga Dam alone could supply all of Central Africa. Um, but an investment could only come in that if there is a wider market, if some of this regional power distributions actually become more viable, and they're already doing a much better job of, you know, in cross-country trade is happening more with power than it is with almost any other product. So, so I think that will lead into tapping into a few of the sites that are extremely competitive, but they're large scale, um, but you need a larger market uh, to tap into them. And I think the more you see that, uh, the more renewable energy projects like that will happen. Um, sorry, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, renewable energy cost was before considered to be very expensive, yeah. I would say five, six, seven years ago. But this is changing dramatically. Yeah. So as I mentioned uh, several times, I think the cost of renewable energy could even go lower in the future. And if you compare with other sources of energy, I think renewable has a massive um, uh, potential. But having said that, you need a base load. And two, you have to have the base load, and on top, if the renew renewable energy can play a vital role, the cost will go down in the future, and there will be more and more renewable energies in the future. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I think. Okay. So I think we have time for one more last question. Maybe over here. Andy. Sure, thank you. The panel have identified that uh, both the grid and the off-grid are going to have to have go full steam ahead uh, to meet these targets to uh, getting universal energy access. But that does mean that they'll come into conflict at some stage. So what happens when grid meets off-grid? Is there emerging best practice as to who should manage operations, uh, how scalability can be managed, and what sort of financial reparations need to be taken? That's a really good question. Yeah. I think, can I uh, Please, give, you, uh, give you a view? Um, I think that the digitization of the modern smart grid will allow you to manage that quite effectively. So I think the technologies to do that are there. They need to be deployed in the type of national matrix that we have just discussed. And then I think you can manage these conflicts very well. That's my view. I mean, even in places like the U.S., you yeah. have a huge amount of off-grid production. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that will always be there. Usually, kind of on-grid system works better when you have, when people migrate to the cities. Uh, usually, what's happening is you invest in rural electrification, and you may not get, like, 
people might move out. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the question is very important. And mm -hmm. if somebody is making an investment, they want them that they're going to make the money back in a very, very long time. Uh, they need to find a way for whatever contract to give them that long horizon yeah. of predictability. So what, what I'm sorry, did you so, want to Yeah, say and um, off-grid and on-grid can supplement to each other. And mm -hmm. for example, a big power duty companies like EDF, they're investing to off-grid. Because they're interested in off-grid, maybe not. The off-grid area can become on-grid in the future, and it depends on the situation. So I think off-grid and on-grid can supplement each other to be able to, 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 to achieve 100% electric, electric, electric energy um, supply in the future. So that's, mm -hmm. it's not a conflict, but it's rather a complementary um, power source. So what I'm hearing from this panel is essentially there seems like a real possibility that we can increase access using a range of technologies, whether it be fossil fuels, renewables, off-grid, on-grid, lowering costs of renewables and so forth. So it seems that you seem positive about that, that we can increase the access to the urban and rural areas, which will drive up economic growth and do so in such a way that will reduce emissions. So Africa can take its own path there. And the last thing I'm hearing was also I'm sensing that um, there's a willingness between the private and the public sector to work together to do this. So thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, um, for you. your time and for sharing your views. And also thank you to the audience um, for your contribution and for coming. Thank you. Thank you.